been a while since I've been behind this pulpit. About 11 years ago, it was not the most recent occasion, but one that I remember, the pastor asked me to fill in for several Sundays in a row, and I selected the book of James because I could get enough sermons out of that to fill up the space. And one of the major themes of the book of James is how to be happy in hard times. And that was the week, I think it was the week, we found out that my wife has cancer. She still has cancer, and the treatments are successful. Thank you for your prayers. Uh, this year, our daughter and her husband and three grandchildren have moved into half of our house. So my theme this morning has to do with children. <clears throat> I'm hoping that the pastor will assign me a topic, something like uh, how to cope with a million dollars for the glory of God. <laughs> you know, maybe, uh, maybe something will work out. But uh, God doesn't let his spokespeople get away with just talking to others. We, uh, we have to be hearers of the word and not just preachers only. Sixty years ago, when I was a preschooler, I spent uh, my school hours in a place we called nursery school. My mother had to work, sometimes two jobs, to support our fatherless home. And uh, a question came up among my friends. Who's the best? Well, that question could mean many things. Often we could settle that with a foot race or with a wrestling match or we could see who could do the most push-ups or the most pull-ups or who could throw a rock the farthest or the most accurate or things like that. Simple issues that could be easily settled. But on this particular day there was a contest that I didn't know how to stage. I didn't know how to answer. The question was this, who's the best? Elvis or the Beatles? Well, I was not a music officiato. I, I didn't know who they were. I, I did sit on my living room floor and saw Ed Sullivan's first broadcast of the Beatles. I remember that. My grandmother said, that hair's not real. <laughs> and soon I'd be watching Elvis's movies. But I didn't know them enough to fight for who was the best. But my friends took it very seriously. It, it almost came to pushing matches. So I looked at both sides of it and I thought, well, I have more friends in this group than that, that group, so I'll side with these over here. And I remember throwing my two cents in. Well, if you're interested, Elvis sold 139 million records. And the Beatles sold 183 million. So you can decide for yourself, if you wish. Today people argue over who's the greatest athlete. They call them the greatest of all time. That's right, the GOAT. And for basketball, who do you think they'll say? Who? Well, a... A record I saw would be Michael Jordan, but some people want to say Kobe Bryant or others. Football. Tom Brady comes up a lot. Baseball. Babe Ruth was on the list I saw. This was easy. Golf. Of course. Tiger Woods. Tennis. Easy again, I think. Roger Federer. Men's tennis, anyway. Boxing. I am the greatest. <laughs> Muhammad Ali said that about himself. Many others agree. Of all time. Hockey wasn't even on the list I saw, but who would you think? Wayne Gretzky. All right. So who really is the greatest of all time? People argue about this. The disciples also were arguing about this. 
they had a very important question. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now this question appears in Matthew, Mark, and John, and Luke. Mark and Luke show them arguing about it. But in Matthew's account, they bring the question to Jesus. Which is the best place to bring the questions to. You're going to get the right answer there. And we read it in Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 and 2. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child to himself and set him among them. Today's lesson is Jesus' answer to that question. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And other important things Jesus said along the way. Now some of the disciples had recently been shown great favor by Jesus himself. In Matthew chapter 16, Peter was led by the Holy Spirit to answer one of Jesus' questions when he said, Who do men say that I am? Other disciples said, well, you're one of the prophets, maybe Elijah, maybe some think this and that. But the God Almighty told Peter who he was, and Peter spoke up. This time he, he got it right. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said in front of everybody else, blessed are you, Simon Peter, for flesh and blood is not shown this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And you are Peter now. That name means rock, you know. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you open will be open, whatever you lock will be closed. Our Catholic friends believe that means that Peter in some way, is the greatest under Jesus in the kingdom of heaven. He's His representative on earth. Most of us believe that that's not really what Jesus was getting at. Peter was named after the rock. But Peter is not the rock. All of us make up stones in the great temple of the house of God. Peter said that himself. We're living stones. The real rock upon which the church is built is that truth that Peter spoke by the Holy Spirit. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But in recognizing Peter as the instrument of that declaration, Jesus conferred upon him a high privilege. A unique calling. In any case, one chapter later, in chapter 17, Jesus called away Peter, James, and John to a mountain we know now as the Mount of Transfiguration. And there, these three disciples were privileged to see something nobody had seen. All the disciples saw Jesus clothed in flesh. But here, with only Peter, James, and John watching, he manifested Himself in all His glory, shining like the sun. Even Moses and Elijah showed up to have a conversation with Jesus about what the Gospel calls His soon exodus, leaving His life of enslavement to a life of freedom. We know that as His atoning death for us. Peter, James, and God, John got to listen in on that conversation. We should not be surprised, therefore, that this dispute would arise among the disciples. Who is the greatest? Furthermore, after Peter's confession, Jesus began to tell His disciples that the Son of Man must die. I'm going to be leaving you. That was hard for them to take. Peter disagreed with it. But he said that nonetheless. It may have began to gnaw at them. When he's gone, who's going to be our leader? And so the question can naturally arise. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? 
The lesson we have today is that which Jesus told them. What He told them we need to hear today. And we come to verse 2. And He called a child to Himself and set Him among them. I'm so glad Jesus made things simple. He's a good teacher. He takes what we understand and He builds on it. That's what teachers need to do. I can't tell you, you've probably experienced it too, the great frustration I have had in some of my education uh, opportunities, sometimes with a lack of ability. Professors start about three or four notches beyond what I can grasp. Mathematics is especially difficult like that. I always wanted to say, can you back up? I don't get this much. I can't understand that till I understand this. I'll tell you what really bothers me is any instructions I think I have ever seen for how to operate a cell phone. <laughs> and it's a lot worse for computers. The people who write these things, I said in the early service I had to repent of it, but it is how I feel sometimes. You ought to line them all up and just shoot them in the head. <laughs> the instructions they give are worthless because they assume you understand things you don't understand. It takes hours to figure it out. When if they would just start at the right place, I could follow it. Well, Jesus starts at the right place. Almost everything He taught was undeniably understandable at one level. He talked about things people were very familiar with. But he taught in such a way that if, if you were interested, if you were honest, if you just were thoughtful a little bit, you could see far more in what Jesus was saying. He would tell parables. Earthly stories with heavenly meaning. And our lesson today is built around this child. He's the earthly story. And so we come to verse 3. Here is where Jesus tells us how to begin in the kingdom of heaven. And then in verse 4, how to grow in the kingdom of heaven. Let's read verse 3. And he said, truly I say to you, unless you change and become like children, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And then how to grow? So whosoever will humble himself like this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. We'll take these one at a time. First, how to begin. To enter the kingdom of heaven, we have to change. That's what Jesus was saying. Unless you change and become like children, you'll not enter into the kingdom of heaven. We must leave behind the so-called progress of our supposed maturity. We need to go back to the innocent time, the open days when we were little children. For people who think they are spiritually mature, this would seem shocking. In effect, Jesus told His disciples that their ideas of greatness is not heaven's idea of greatness. We expect the greatest among us to be wise and strong. Heaven puts more value in innocence and dependent trust. When I was a boy, we didn't have a lot of playgrounds close by. But we had trees. Any tree was a playground in my neighborhood. And there was a patch of them behind everybody's house on our block. We called it the woods. Several acres of grown-up mess that we played in. One tree went up tall, about as high as these chandeliers before it branched out. You couldn't get up the trunk. But thankfully in Mobile, trees don't just grow up, they grow sideways. And their branches would fall down low to the ground. 
And if you could grab a hold of one of those branches and you were skillful enough, you could wiggle your way up to a stout branch and work your way over, negotiating all the little branches that come out of the limb and you could get to that trunk. And we did that. About three of us. But when we got to the trunk, it was getting dark. And we were afraid to work our way back over. And that's a long way for a little boy to jump. So we started hollering out there in what we called the woods. One little boy, I think it was the son of one of the neighboring fathers, one of the, his brothers was up in the tree with me, ran and got his dad, and he came. He saw we were in a fix. So he did what any dad would do, stood at the base and said, jump, I'll catch you. I looked at him and I said, not me, <laughs> not, not, not me. No way. But his son, that's a different story. His son had practice, I think, jumping off the bunk bed. His son understood his father, had experience with his father. He didn't have any trouble. He jumped off there like a robin out of a nest, baby. And his dad caught him, no problem. Then somebody else had courage to do it. And I thought, well, if it worked twice. <laughs> so I did. And he caught me and I'm living here today. <laughs> All right. We rely on the Heavenly Father. And if we know Him as our Father... It's a lot easier to rely on Him. And that's the kind of faith we need to have. We need to be like little children. The wise and the strong rely on themselves. And sometimes they end up getting treed. They reject the rule of God and establish kingdoms of their own. Jesus said that to enter the kingdom of heaven, we must be children of heaven. We must not say that my ideas are best. We must not say that my way is the best. The life I want to lead is the best. We must be willing to accept Jesus and His way as the best. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And if we should think that Jesus is asking too much here, Think about what he told to Nicodemus. He didn't just say you need to be like a child. He said you must be born again. You talk about starting over. That's all the way back. Now Nicodemus was a great teacher of the Jews. He spent a great deal of time qualifying for that position. Known all throughout Judea as an authority on Moses' law, a settler of disputes, the great teacher of Israel, Jesus called him. And yet Jesus looked at him right in the face and said this, Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Well, Nicodemus heard that in a shocking way. That's strange. That's how do you expect a man that's grown to enter into his mother's body again? That's too much. Jesus didn't back up one bit. Truly I say unto you, except a man is born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. It's a matter of starting over. He said it's this way. To be born of the Spirit is like this. The wind blows where it comes from. You hear the sound of it. But you can't tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. And in the context of this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, we have these most memorable words. 
helping explain it all to us. The most famous verse of the gospel, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Nicodemus could give you the list of duties. Nicodemus could explain how one law relates to another, has precedent over another. He could outline all the possibilities of serving God under the law of Moses. Jesus told him, you got to start over. you got to get back to the Spirit. You've got to trust the One who is given for the salvation of the world. So to begin in the kingdom of God, we must be changed. We must stop doing things our way. We must be led by the Spirit of God to have faith in the love of God and to accept Jesus as our Savior, the Son of God. We cannot be great in the kingdom of heaven until we enter the kingdom of heaven. And we cannot enter the kingdom of heaven without being changed to become like little children. Not wise in our own conceit. Not confident in our own ability. Not boastful in our own accomplishments. We must repent of these things. And we must become like little children. In the New Testament, repentance, you see, is not a sometimes lesson. Some people think repentance is no longer applicable. But if you read the true record of preaching in the New Testament, you'll see Repentance is always applicable. It's the first sermon John the Baptist preached. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's it's the first sermon Jesus preached. Repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Jesus sent His disciples out to prepare the cities and towns and villages for His coming, they went out everywhere and preached that men should repent. And in Luke's account of the Great Commission, it says that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in His name among all nations. In Acts chapter 2, when the Gospel gave birth to the church through the Holy Spirit, people standing by wondered what was happening. Peter explained it to them. And they said, well, what must we do? Peter said this, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far away, as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now, is God calling you today? If you listen, if you ponder... If you are honest before God, you may hear His voice today. And He's saying this, start over. Go back. Stop trusting your own way. Trust Jesus' way. And this brings us to the second lesson we should learn from this little child. Jesus told us how to grow. In the kingdom of heaven. In effect, Jesus said that heaven thinks more of us when we think less of ourselves. Look at verse 4. So whoever will humble himself like this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You know, the kingdom of heaven is not full of people this world calls great. Our Savior, the one who best lived out the kingdom of heaven, was meek and lowly. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1, Consider your calling, brothers and sisters, not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. God has chosen the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, so that no human may boast before God. If pride is the root of all sin. Humility, in some surprising way, is the root of all love and righteousness. And that's why Jesus said, 
we need to humble ourselves like this little child. Pride says, I am important. I must be served. Pride disregards others. Even can disregard God. Pride is the root of all evil and all sin. Humility says, you are more important than me. You must be served more than me. Humility leads us to love others and to love God Himself. In some surprising way, humility is the root of all love and righteousness. If we practice what we call our righteousness for righteousness' sake, then our righteousness is no better than that of the scribes and Pharisees. They strained at gnats and swallowed camels. They did what was considered right and proper on the outside, but on the inside they were full of wickedness, deceit, and selfishness. If we prefer to glorify God and do what is best for other people, before we seek our own desires, if we humbly practice a true love for God and for others, then we'll be led by that love into the true righteousness. Later in Matthew 22, Jesus said that all the prophets and the law hang on these two commandments, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And Paul said in his most famous epistle to the Romans, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For the one who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is surmised, summed up in this one saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. You see, God is interested in what we do because what we do affects other people. But even more than what we do, God is interested in why we do it. Because that comes from the heart. And God judges us for our heart's position even more than the practices we want to lay claim as the basis of our merit. Some have thought that the child is a role model because of the great faith that children have. I don't think really that's what is being said here. Children can have a pure faith because they are innocent of the complicating questions that plague the adult mind. Their faith can be simple and pure. Children can have a passionate faith. Because, let's face it, children are passionate about a lot of things. But I don't think we should say that many children have a very strong faith. If we're honest about children, children have a vulnerable faith. Look how many children purely have faith and passionately have faith in the Easter Bunny and the Tooth Fairy and Santa Claus. You want to see passion? See a little five-year-old kid pull out a tooth and put it under his pillow. See a child make out a list to Santa Claus. See how all the excitement they exhibit on Christmas Eve. You'll see pl plenty of trust. You'll see plenty of passion. Not many children keep that up past fifth grade. Now children can grow into a strong faith. And that's why we need to plant seeds in these little ones. Those small little saplings grow up to be firm and strong. But not without the tests of experience. Not without the increase in wisdom. So while children are our role model for humility... I really don't think we should say that there are many children with very, very strong faith. They can be born again, and they can grow into strong faith. 
But as a rule, children are vulnerable, and Jesus knew it. And that's why he says what he says later. Adults must become more like children when it comes to humility. In adopting childlike humility, we learn to trust God and not ourselves. We learn to live for God and not ourselves. In short, we become true children of heaven. We live under God's rule. And the greater we love in humility, the greater Almighty God recognizes us as carrying the heart of His true children. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, because God is love. So number one, to begin in the kingdom of heaven, we must start over like children. We must abandon our own way and accept Christ's way. Number two, to grow in the kingdom of heaven, We must humble ourselves. We must see others as more important than ourselves. And if we love children, then we must recognize how vulnerable they are. And Jesus knew this. This leads us to the third lesson in Jesus' example of the child. We see this in verses 5-7. through In heaven's judgment... There is nothing more precious on earth than little children. Let me say that again. In heaven's judgment, there is nothing more precious on earth than little children. Five through seven. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin... It is better for him that a heavy millstone be hung around his neck and that he be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks. For it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. But woe to the person through whom the stumbling block comes. Listen. Jesus quickly forgave adulterers and prostitutes like the Samaritan woman. Jesus quickly forgave publicans who robbed their countrymen to enrich themselves, like Matthew the tax collector. Jesus quickly forgave even people who persecuted other Christians to death, like the Apostle Paul. But when it comes to offending little children, these words show us a different side of Jesus. It's the same passion that led him out of the temple to craft a cord into a whip and to come back in, not in any polite way, to drive the money changers from his father's house, to turn over their money tables, and to say, you have turned this holy place of prayer into a den of thieves, and it ought not to be so. When it comes to children, there's no more important thing we ever do than to leave them a good example. There's nothing more important we ever do than to train them in the right way, to encourage their faith. Jesus was very jealous for the welfare of children. Imagine the worst crime possible against another human being. What do you think it would be? Look, it doesn't matter how bad that crime is. It's far worse when committed against a child. Even minor offenses that we would consider minor against another person, they're exponentially worse when given against a child. These past several decades have earned Christianity across the world a terrible black eye because more than one denomination has been exposed for their leadership offending little children. 
We've got a lot to make up for as Christians on this score. We need to police our own on this score. We need to make sure that we do not offend these little ones. But on a positive note, we have a wonderful opportunity to do what is good for these little children. Vacation Bible schools coming up. Some of you are already enrolled to teach for that. Some of you little children are anticipating coming to that. Look, there is nothing our church ever does that's more important than that. If what Jesus said is true, there's nothing more important we do. Charlie, thank you for your missionary work there. It's wonderful that you're helping spread the gospel across the world. But I'll tell you this. Heaven's looking more at what you do for the children over there than the adults. And I'll say this. As long as any society has one believing child, there is hope for that society. We've got to take care of our children. As parents and grandparents, the most important thing we do is how we affect our children. Society rises and falls on the effect that parents have on their children, both fathers and mothers. And if you don't believe me, go to those realms of our society where there are very few active fathers in the homes, and you'll see how disastrous an effect that is for society. We must tend to our children and our grandchildren. Now, parents cannot protect their children from all offense. Jesus said it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. But woe to the person through whom the stumbling block comes. Sometimes our children are led astray from every good effort we try to give to them. But never let it be said that a Christian parent is the cause of their child's offense. Protect yourself from that Humbly love your children. Put them top on your list. Sometimes people are criticized for the decisions they make in their family. They do it only for the children. Only for the children. Well, when you're living for your children, you're living for what God wants you to live for. That's the right thing. And to offend them is to do the worst thing imaginable. That's our highest calling. And I think that's what Jesus meant by all of this. In verses 8 and 9, Jesus said it would be better to cut off your hand. Give up your occupation. Cut off your foot. Change your way of life. Pull out your eye. Anything you covet or are desirous for. Abandon it. Better to give up everything you have than to offend. To be a cause of offense against these little children. Jesus is, is teaching here that in heaven's judgment, there is nothing more precious on earth than little children. And that leads us to the last verse in our text. Verse 10. See that you do not look down on one of these little ones. For I say to you that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Heaven's interested in your children. Heaven's interested in your neighbor's children. Heaven's interested in the district's children. And in just a few weeks, we're going to get a chance to show how much our church is interested in all of these children in Vacation Bible School. Now I want you to take out the church bulletin. Please. If you were given one, take it out. Uh, Reed showed you this form right here. I want everybody to look at it. Now, if you're able to give one part of a day, June the 26th through June the 30th, to help Vacation Bible School, just do something. I want you to put your name on that. All right? And our church will contact you and find out when you're going to be available and you can come be obedient to the call of Jesus to value what heaven values. Relating with little children may not be your thing. 
I've taught in school every grade but the third grade. I've taught every age in Sunday school that, I, that we have. All the divisions. Every time I taught an older group, I enjoyed it more. I'm so delighted now that we have four 90-year-old people in my Sunday school class. I think I'm fitted for the older folks. Right? But if you're available, there's something you can do, even if you're not good at being directly involved with children. You can cut out stuff. You can help pick up stuff. Can you pass out a cookie? Can you break up little scuffles when children are fighting over cookies? Can you open a door to the restroom? Can you go in and pick up paper? If you can do anything like this, you will be engaged in the most important ministry that this church conducts. Vacation Bible school. If what Jesus said is true, then I think that is also true. Heaven values children more than anything in this world, and we should too. Amen? So, how many of you pulled that out and put your name on it? Raise your hand. Let me see. Some of you kind of reluctant? Come on now. Get it out. Some of you will be here. I want you to do that and then turn it in. If you need to contact Tim Helm, I'll tell you how to do it. He's our children's director. Tim at forestbaptistchurch.org Tim at forestbaptistchurch.org you send him an email, say, I'll be available this time from 8 to 12, June the 26th through June the 30th, and he will get back to you. There's something you can do in this important ministry. Let's stand. We're going to pray just now. And if you need to get started in the kingdom of heaven, if you need to go back, and start over like Jesus said, become like a little child. Give up your own ambitions and take on Jesus' way. You can publicly do that now. Jesus said, if we confess Him before men, He'll confess us before our Father which is in heaven. If you are a Christian, but you've grown weak in your commitment, you haven't been as humble as we need to be. You can start afresh with that too. And now's the time of decision. Now's the time to recommit yourself. I'm going to stand here and we're going to pray. Pray right now and then I'll come. Joe, you come ahead now. The instrumentalist can come now. And we're going to pray. And if you have not yet received Christ as your Savior, you're ready to quit depending on yourself. Have that innocent trust in Jesus. And you can come and profess that publicly here. We'll pray with you. And you can leave this place knowing that you've been born again. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we pray that the Spirit of God will attend to that heart, which may be furthest from you. I pray you'll bring faith to that heart. And I pray that you'll bring courage to walk this aisle and profess faith in you. Help each one to pray. As many of us have prayed, Father, forgive us for our sins. Forgive me. Thank you for Jesus dying for me and living for me to show how I should live. I give up my own way and I'm ready to take on Jesus' way. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.